Ron Heifetz is the King Hussein bin Talal Senior Lecturer in Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School, where he's also the Faculty Chair of the Executive Program, The Art and Practice of Leadership Development, and founder of the Center for Public Leadership. He speaks extensively and advises heads of governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout the world. He co-developed the widely recognized adaptive leadership framework. His research focuses on creating a conceptual foundation for the study of leadership, creating teaching, training, and consulting methods for leadership practice, and building the adaptive capacity of organizations and society. He has authored or co-authored several books, such as Leadership Without Easy Answers, which is one of the 10 most assigned course books at Harvard and Duke universities. Heifetz is also well known for developing transformative methods of leadership education and development. His courses on leadership at Harvard are legendary. Drawing students from throughout Harvard's graduate schools and neighboring universities, they have consistently won the Alumni Award for the Kennedy School's most influential course. A graduate from Columbia University, Harvard Medical School, and the Kennedy School. He's also a physician and a cellist. Over to you, Ron. It's so, uh, so great to be with you uh, all uh, during this hour, and I look forward to hearing your questions um, in a little while. I thought I would begin by just uh, introducing some concepts. I know that some of you have worked with me and are acquainted with my work, but many of you may not be, so I'm going to assume that that, uh, that I'm new to many of you and, and sort of begin then at, at the beginning. I, I wanna start actually by introducing the idea of, uh, of crisis itself and, and anchor our conversation in that because uh, all around the world we're um, all experiencing at least two crises and in the United States we're in the middle of three crises. Uh, we all have the pandemic as a major crisis uh, that's requiring adaptability throughout uh, our communities from the most micro level of every family and every individual person uh, to uh, gradually ma more macro levels, every organization, be it business or nonprofit or public, every schoolroom, every schoolhouse, and certainly every government from local to national governments. Uh, the pandemic is generating uh, global massive uh, cha uh, challenge to the adaptability of people um, uh, from local to to uh, uh, to global, and that in and of itself is an extremely interesting phenomenon, a challenging phenomenon, because it's not only a challenge to our health; it's of course a challenge to how we live and how we make uh, a living, and uh, and that and then the. A secondary challenge, of course, that we're all living through is the economic challenge associated with the closing down of our economies. And then in the United States, we're in the midst of a third crisis, which uh, has uh, uh, in some ways been accentuated by the pandemic because the pandemic in the United States has surfaced uh, the uh, structural inequities and the systemic inequities uh, in the American society. That may also be true in many other societies. I, I believe it is true from what I know all around the world that the poor are taking the brunt of the disease and the people who are living in uh, most dense quarters and have least access to health care are the most vulnerable to getting sick and dying of this, uh, of this virus. So uh, in, the, in the surfacing of all of that inequity, we also um, have had a, a dramatic incidence of police brutality that was fortunately captured so vividly on camera that it enabled everybody across the American nation to have to face into a reality that, that is often uh, ignored and denied uh, and kept beneath the surface. Some people, of course, are aware of this reality every single day as they go out there of their houses and have to worry about being um, uh, endangered by, uh, by police or questioned. Um, but m many of us, including people like me, white men, can walk out our house and not have to think twice about being harassed or endangered. So uh, the surfacing of this police brutality is generating, as many of you know, widespread demonstrations across the United States and indeed sympathetic um, demonstrations all around the world uh, to fight um, all the different kinds of structure structural racism or structured inequity that are built into many of our societies. So 
one way to understand a crisis, and now I'm going to share with you just the one slide that I have to share with you today. One way to understand crises is that they generate a spike of disequilibrium. This orange, uh, this orange graph. You know, people are living in some state of relative equilibrium, but then something happens that creates a spike of disequilibrium, a spike of stress in the social system. And at that moment, the uh, uh, all of us in uh, in human societies and organizational lives uh, immediately respond to the stress, to the disequilibrium, by going into problem-solving mode. And if the problem happens to be a technical problem, then even if it's generated a high amount of momentary disequilibrium, we have the know-how to resolve the problem, to solve the problem, and the level of disequilibrium re returns to normal. And that happens even with life-threatening illnesses uh, that I used to see in the emergency room in the hospital, uh, where a person would come in and there would be an enormous amount of distress in the family as well as in that own person's uh, uh, emotional life. Uh, but quite quickly, we often, you know, a, a great deal of the time had the know-how, the instruments, the organizational design, the authoritative expertise, the materials, and all of the economic system to back us up, to provide us with the materials we needed to cure that patient of that problem, and that that patient could then return to a normal life. Uh, sometimes very quickly, you know, if it was a child with a broken leg, uh, then within six weeks, you could take the cast off and equilibrium would be restored and the problem would be solved. But there are many crises that, that are not uh, purely technical problems. There are crises that require people to learn new ways, where the challenge itself uh, demands that people develop new ad adaptations, new adaptive capacity in order to solve the problem uh, in, in ways that they hadn't known how to solve it before. And these problems, adaptive challenges, do not resolve quickly. It's what we see in this blue line. They generate prolonged levels of dis disequilibrium or prolonged levels of stress. And one of the challenges of leadership then is to hold people in a productive range of stress and, and orchestrate and manage and lead the process so that the the kind of capacity building learning takes place so that people learn new ways, discover what they need to do, change some of their old mindsets, and then once they have learned how to meet the adaptive challenge, equilibrium is restored, but at a new level of functioning. So this basic chart uh, or, or, or graphic uh, illustrates the sort of the basic uh, uh, some of the basic properties that distinguish adaptive challenges from technical challenges um, with the onset of a crisis. Now, some adaptive challenges are exogenous and some adaptive challenges are endogenous. And by that, I mean that the adaptive pressures that demand new capacity building, that demand a change in the way people live or change in the way a business operates or change in the way that citizens understand their role or change in the way school teachers teach or change in the way police police, uh, adaptive pressures can be exogenously generated by the environment. Uh, and the COVID virus, the coronavirus uh, 19 uh, disease is that kind of adaptive pressure. It's an adaptive pressure that emerges in the environment. Um, and maybe people participate in it by by making it easier for the virus to cross from, from bats or, or other animals, in the case of HIV, from, from certain monkeys to people through the eating of, that, of, the, of those animals. But nevertheless, the, the challenge itself, the adaptive pressure, um, is not endogenous to human societies. It's not endogenous to our own cultures. It's really coming from the outside. Um, and that kind of challenge is the typical kind of challenge that organisms face in evolutionary time as they all of a sudden uh, meet uh, a change in the environment. The, you know, the climate becomes dry or the climate becomes cold or the climate becomes warm. And that then creates a change in the economic conditions, the environmental conditions uh, by which the animal will have to hunt or, or feed uh, or graze. 
And that then generates adaptive pressures that select for in evolution, uh, those organisms that are more prone to having uh, that the capacity to thrive in that new environment. That's how nature works. In nature, adaptive pressures are largely exogenous, generated by the environment. Um, but in human cultures, a lot of adaptive pressures are endogenous. They're generated within our own cultures. That is that people within the culture demand changes of the dominant culture. And, uh, and that's what we're seeing in the race crisis in America. Um, uh, and, and parallel kinds of crises of inequity around the world. We're seeing an endogenously generated crisis in which a group of people are saying to the rest of the society, there is an internal contradiction in our own values. And in the face of this internal contradiction, we have to stop living in a stable state of equilibrium that uh, keeps this internal contradiction alive, uh, unresolved, uh, and, um, and in discrepancy from what our orienting values are as a community, as a society. And that work of knocking a society out of equilibrium into disequilibrium, so that it then begins to do the adaptive work it needs to do um, in order to come up with a new way of policing, a new way of educating, for example, around race, a new way of governing, a new way of paying taxes, but much more deeply, a new way of understanding our identities, our identities as white or brown or black people, our identities as uh, from our ethnicity or from our religious heritage, what, what is built into the cultural DNA of our identity? And how will that identity itself need to be refashioned? Now, one of the lessons we learned from nature, and I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll say, well, maybe before I go into that, I'll say one more thing about this slide. People don't like to do adaptive work. Adaptive work is painful work because it consists of three basic tasks. The first task is sifting through what to conserve. In nature, adaptive work is highly conservative. Uh, even a transformative change will be largely conservative. Most of the DNA of a chimpanzee is the same as the DNA of a human being, and yet human beings have transformative capacities com compared to a chimpanzee, even when 99% of our DNA is the same. So um, nature or God, as you choose, is enormously efficient in the sense that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You don't start from scratch. You don't do zero-based budgeting. You build from what works. And then you, um, uh, you discard what's no longer serviceable. And then you innovate. Those are the three tasks in adaptive change. You identify what is precious and essential to conserve, what needs to be discarded from our current cultural DNA, and what innovations will enable us to take the best of our history into the future. That's the essential uh, demand of adaptive work. And in a sense, from my point of view, that is the essence of leadership, is the mobilization of adaptive work in which you help people uh, evolve their cultures so that, or, and adapt their cultures so that those cultures live up to the highest values that those cultures stand for and begin to resolve the internal contradictions of those cultures. So that's hard work because the innovation takes time. You can't restore equilibrium quickly. For example, right now, it's going to take time to innovate a, a, a coronavirus vaccine. And we're all going to have to live in a suspended state of disequilibrium. It could be for at least a year, for a full year, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to keep our families afloat, how we're going to teach school, how we're going to um, keep people from committing suicide, keep people from despairing. Parents are going to have to learn how to, how to manage with children at home and how to teach their children and still work online and so forth. There are going to be, have to be countless adaptations that are required just to sustain ourselves until we finally have a technical fix, a vaccine, an innovation to, 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 uh, to solve the virus crisis. So this hard work of sifting through what to conserve, what to discard, and the innovation um, takes time. And it involves losses. 
because even if you can conserve 90% of your cultural DNA of your heritage, even if 90% of what your parents taught you and your grandparents taught you and what your preachers taught you was right and wonderful and full of love and full of wisdom, some percentage of it is wrong and some percentage of it is internally um, contradictory. It's, uh, it's um, at war with itself. Uh, we say we stand for equality and equal opportunity in America, but yet we don't really have equal right for voting and we don't really have equal opportunity for people uh, across the board. And our deep assumptions of white superiority are left frequently unaddressed uh, in our family cultures as well as even in our theologies. So the work that is required in adaptive work involves losses. Even if it's just 5% of your cultural DNA, these are tough losses because it's very difficult to renegotiate your loyalty with your own ancestry. To say, my ancestors were wonderful, but they were also partially wrong. My grandparents were wonderful, but they were also partially wrong. They fought the wrong war. They made deep mistakes. Some of what they taught me isn't right, and I don't want to live with that anymore. That process of feeling some sense of internal betrayal. Am I betraying my, my loved ones? Am I betraying my family? Am I betraying the people who taught me, my ancestry? Uh, is a very, very difficult emotional work. And because it's so difficult, people resist it deeply. People resist it like the plague. Um, and so we frequently see, instead of people staying in that zone of disequilibrium, in a productive range of stress, doing the work they need to do to renegotiate their loyalty and refashion those relationships and, 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 and build an, a new set of expectations where they can depart and still be um, loyal to, still be part of their heritage, even though they're departing in part. Uh, that work of getting to that place um, uh, takes time and it takes a lot of emotional energy and a lot of emotional support. And so instead of doing that kind of emotional work, people frequently avoid it. And we have all sorts of mechanisms in our societies for avoiding adaptive work, for running away, uh, be it frank denial or externalizing the enemy. Uh, we don't really have a problem. The problem is those people, you see, they're really causing their illness. Um, the race problem is really a problem of black people's culture. Um, if they only... Uh, did X, Y, and Z differently, we wouldn't have any problem, and so forth, as if the problem were out there rather than actually in here, something that we ourselves as part of the dominant uh, parts of the society need to own. Um, so in the avoidance of our own responsibility taking, in the avoidance of distributing the work all the different places where it belongs, which may include poor people and which may include um, disenfranchised people in the sense that there's work for them to do in gaining a voice, in figuring out how to take pride in themselves independent of what the external society tells them. Or with the coronavirus crisis, how to, you know, as I said before, how to uh, manage your kids at home uh, when, uh, um, uh, when you're also trying to work and they're, they want to run in front of your camera and they want to crawl on your lap while you're, you're trying to carry on a meeting. Um, the adaptations required are demanded of all of us. And if we could avoid those adaptations with some technical fix or some easy workaround, we would do it. Um, but real adaptive processes where we develop new capacity, where now we can learn how to juggle those three balls in the air at the same time, that takes time. Um, now, the work avoidance patterns that people engage in routinely, they have two basic common denominators. You know, one is distraction. You know, this is not my problem. I don't have to look at it. Uh, displaced responsibility is the second. This, this is not my problem. This is problems over there. Or uh, I'm just not going to look at this problem. You know, I'm, I'm just going to look at what's pretty. I'm going to go outside and pretend that this virus is invisible or we're already on the other side of it. As if, as if, you know, I don't have to think. So um, one of the challenges of leadership then is to spot work avoidance patterns as they emerge and find ways then to counteract them, to speak to people, to keep the uh, hard questions back 
into the center of their attention and to get them to realize that they have to take responsibility, that they are part of the problem and that they are then part of the solution. And the leadership challenge then of building narratives and stories, teaching moments, using various ways to speak, to illustrate, including demonstrations, that's another teaching uh, uh, moment, to get people to face into the internal contradictions and to begin to examine how they might need to refashion some of their current ways of doing things um, in order to uh, uh, um, thrive in a, in a changing and challenging world vis-a-vis -vis the uh, virus or in order to begin to realize the uh, overarching values of their community um, in the case of what's happening right now in the United States. So I'll take this, take this off uh, and uh, so I can speak to you a little bit more directly. Um, so what does that mean then? You know, it means that, um, um, that uh, one of the uh, most basic patterns that, uh, that are generated in human societies when people uh, experience a spike in disequilibrium. One of the most common patterns is uh, to turn to authority. In times of distress, people turn to their authority figures, their elders, for comfort, for direction, for protection, for the restoration of order. And we can see all around the world then, people in positions of authority under enormous pressure during this coronavirus uh, uh, crisis to restore equilibrium quickly, to treat the adaptive challenge as if it were a technical problem, to, to try to return people to the normalcy that they want. But the virus is not letting us do that. It, we can pretend we can do that, but we're going to just invite another wave of, de of death and illness. So, but we can see authority figures throughout the land in businesses, in schools, in uh, religious organizations, and certainly in politics, from uh, local politics to national politics. We can see the enormous pressure on authorities to restore equilibrium in the, in, in when there's a spike of disequilibrium even if it means engaging in work avoidance patterns. Now, because the coronavirus crisis is so widespread, it's giving us the opportunity to, to see uh, a wide distribution of uh, successful and unsuccessful cases of leadership from people in positions of authority. Some people in positions of authority are really practicing leadership. That is, they're really stepping into the issue and, and engaging their people in tough, difficult messages, painful messages that say, this is a reality that I can't fix quickly. This is a reality that, I mean, I wish it were something that I could just take off our platters, but th this reality is gonna be with us for a while now because the genie got out of the bottle and we made real mistakes in not getting ahead of the curve early, early on you know, back in November, December, January, um, uh, when we first began to learn about this crisis. So uh, as a product of that, we're all going to have to own this problem. And I'm here to help us organize the adaptive responses, the emergency responses, in order to diminish the casualty rate and, uh, and stabilize the situation. Um, so, but I can't take it away from you. Now we see some people around the world who are doing that. People in cities, people in uh, states, people in national governments. Um, and they're doing a great job. You know, a good example is Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand who came into office uh, at a young age, 30, 38, 39 years old, immediately uh, um, experienced a, a, a terrible crisis uh, of a massacre um, and in a, in a mosque. And, and then followed up by another crisis of volcanic eruption. So by the time this crisis came on board, you know, in her already short tenure, she was a pretty experienced crisis leader and has responded in a way that has reduced the, the infection load, the new case load in New Zealand down to very low levels. I think it may even be zero, although I, I'm not sure about that. Um, so we do see cases of very successful leadership from people in positions of authority 
uh, around the world. And we also see people in positions of authority, in political authority, buckling, caving into the pressure to provide easy answers, to take the pro to pretend as if the problem were something that we could deny or we could quickly resolve or we could blame somebody else. You know, let's blame the Chinese for the mistakes that they made in not getting ahead of the crisis in the first place. Or let's come up with a paranoid conspiracy that somehow they, they manufactured this crisis. You know, people look for places to blame so that they don't have to own the problem themselves. Um, unfortunately, this virus doesn't really care what our attitudes are. It's an exogenously generated adaptive pressure. And it's going to continue putting pressure on us regardless of how stupid or how smart we are, how courageous we are, or how much in denial, cowardly we are in facing into it. So we see a wide spectrum of people exercising leadership or not exercising leadership in positions of authority. But we're also seeing all sorts of people providing leadership without waiting for the coach to call them into play, without waiting to hold high, off, high office, without waiting to be appointed uh, to some position. They see a problem in their local midst and they simply start mobilizing people to engage in the adaptive work so that, so that um, uh, they can meet that crisis most adaptively. And we're then seeing one of the key properties of adaptive work uh, manifest itself in the coronavirus crisis and also in the race crisis in America, which is we're seeing a lot of leadership without authority. We're seeing a lot of people practice leadership without authority. And we're seeing a lot of people in authority, some of whom practice leadership and a lot of whom are not practicing leadership. So this leads us to a, another key distinction in my own way of thinking about leadership, which is that leadership's not the same as authority. Sometimes people in authority buckle under the pressures to treat adaptive challenges as if they were technical and avoid the adaptive work. And if they're avoiding the adaptive work, as I would understand leadership, they're not providing leadership at all. They're not preparing their people to thrive in a changing and challenging world. And we also see uh, the property of um, a community thrown up against ad new adaptive pressures. We're also seeing that to really engage in adaptive work, you need a distributed leadership model. You can't simply have people fall into a state of dependency in which they wait for some great leader to emerge from a high position of authority. Because if we do depend overly uh, on people in positions of authority to get their act together and provide the leadership we need, we could be in, uh, uh, inviting a devastating set of losses and circumstances. As we've certainly seen in history when people are up against a major economic crisis um, and then turn to some charismatic authority who uh, says that with deep conviction that he, usually he, rarely is she, but occasionally is she, has all the answers, just believe in me, I know where to go. And then people do. On, in a time of distress, again, people look to authority for answers, and people sometimes are more vulnerable in a time of a crisis to uh, charlatans who provide um, the, the, the false security of certainty um, rather than um, the empowerment of believing in people's resourcefulness to face into the uncertainty and meet the challenge. And because people will tend to turn their power, give their power away to these charlatans, we have seen the devastation that can be wrought by a country collectively going over a cliff, uh, led by or fought, misled, misled by somebody in authority who's gathered that kind of power in a time of crisis when people are feeling most bereft and most desperate for, um, quote, a leader, but vulnerable to a charlatan. So we see that in an adaptive uh, challenge, which is the nature of the three-part crisis we're facing right now, the economic crisis, the, vi uh, the, the health crisis from the virus, and then the crisis of inequity that has been <clears throat> Um, um, surfaced because of police brutality in America, but probably is also being surfaced in many countries all around the world because the economic crisis generated and the health crisis are themselves revealing deep uh, structures of inequity in all of our in many of our societies. Uh, these adaptive 
contexts uh, teach us that we need a distributed leadership model in which we need widespread leadership from people with authority and without authority throughout the community. Because to really uh, make progress on an adaptive challenge, we need many micro adaptations to micro environments. How one family figures out how to make it with their particular children and their particular school, with their particular finances, is going to be different than the next family even next door, let alone three miles away in a different community or 100 miles away in a different city. So adaptive work often requires local adaptability to, way, to the ways in which that adaptive pressure is revealing itself in that local environment. And that's true even with the cultural adaptive pressure generated by race and inequity, because different communities have internalized the, an ancestry differently, depending on your particular ancestry. And the way those lines of code of who you are and what it means to carry your identity and, um, and what other people mean and how you're so, been taught to understand them, the rewriting of those lines of code, the refashioning of those loyalties um, will be different for different people and different families from different ancestries, different communities, and so forth. So that if you have, um, in, in America, if you have uh, uh, racist assumptions about the capacity of African American people, those racist assumptions will be very different if you have Chinese ancestry or Japanese ancestry or Jewish ancestry or, or white Protestant ancestry or white Catholic ancestry or Pakistani ancestry. You know, each, each peoples will have to wrestle with their ancestry the way it has internalized different algorithms of identity and superiority within that particular culture. It may not be ethnic, maybe it's religious. You know, but many cultures have built into its identity DNA, its cultural DNA, many subcultures, various lines of code, sometimes subtle lines of code that talk about how we're better, we're better than they are. And those lines of code, the rewriting of those lines of code uh, is what's being demanded of us, certainly in the United States, uh, by the people on the streets who are forcing us to face into the internal contradictions of those of us who also, with our, the very next breath, uh, deeply believe that, uh, uh, that all people uh, were created equal and all people deserve equal opportunity and all people are worthy of respect and care and, and, and love, loving response. So um, I hope that just begins to uh, introduce the, these uh, four very complex themes, leadership, authority, adaptability, um, and trust in the midst of a crisis. Trust is complicated because uh, if people are trusting you to be the authoritative know -how expert and they trust you because you're going to show them the clear way forward, one has to renegotiate the terms of trust so that now they begin to trust you for saying, I'm not sure what to do. So now stay with me in the game as we learn together, as we discover and experiment together as we rewrite some of those lines of code and figure out over the next years what it's going to take to renew uh, our own uh, set of values and renew our communities. Um, that means that one of the key challenges of leadership from a position of authority is the renegotiation of the terms of trust so that now you're trusted actually to be truthful instead of being trusted for simply providing comfort, even if it means uh, conning people and lying to them. So let me stop there and uh, open it up for conversation. So my question has to do with the assessment of risk management when making these decisions about uh, these leadership decisions, particularly when it comes to um, the COVID and how to move back into the economy. Where does risk management come into those decisions? That's a great question. I, I think the risk management will be different in different communities, um, in different families, uh, different, uh, in different contexts. Uh, risk management for New Zealand uh, may have a lot to do with the degree to which they can withstand uh, opening up their economy to their, just their islands and, uh, and, 
and um, uh, at, at the sacrifice of some of the of, of tourism and other sources of economic activity that demand that, that require bringing people in who might reinfect the island. Um, and that'll be very different from people in different cities or communities in the United States where you begin to open up any local economy and you're probably, you know, the roads are open. People will travel from one community to another and begin to reinfect one another. So I, I think, I think it's a very, very tough proposition to, to manage risk assessment. But I, I, it seems to me that the, the best way to do this is to use this as an opportunity to develop citizens' capacity to, uh, to share the burden of some of these uh, risky uh, and experimental decisions. That is to say, we're going to try this, but as soon as we begin to realize that it's uh, too soon. We're going to close back down. Um, and to share that uncertainty and share that risk with, uh, with citizens. Right now, citizens want um, government to carry all of that risk. And government carrying, trying to uh, make all of those risk assessments are under enormous pressure. You know, industries want to open up. Um, uh, and, uh, and workers want to go back to work. Uh, and some people aren't going to be able to feed their families uh, and, and if, you know, if, if they don't start working. So there's, uh, it's going to be very hard if all of, if the risk, if the risk assessments themselves isn't owned widely by the citizenry. Because if it's not owned widely, as soon as people in government begin to make a mistake, it makes it much more difficult for them to adjust. One of the key properties of adaptive work is ongoing adaptability, improvisation. You know, uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, we never could have gotten on the beaches of Normandy without a plan. And the moment we got on the beach, we had to discard the plan. He said as president, planning is really essential and plans are worthless. Because he knew that once you start moving, you've got to have ongoing adaptability and flexibility to keep changing and altering course. Now, people in positions of trust, people in positions of authority, public trust, if they don't include people in those risk assessments, they're going to be held accountable for making mistakes. And it's going to be much harder for them um, to, to take corrective action. So I, 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 I think what I'd like to suggest is that in politics, one stays alive and leads better if you take a longer term approach, which is that you risk a little short term credibility by telling people the truth that you can't um, make an accurate risk assessment, you can't make a perfect risk decision, you're going to, you can try to sequence it, you can try it out, but you're, you're but we're in this together. And um, the degree to which you develop citizen, citizen responsibility taking. So that citizens realize that citizenship is not the same as being a customer. I'm not a customer. You know, uh, you're not my customer, citizen. If you're a politician, you're my citizen. You're my partner. You know, um, I'm not here just to please you. You know, I'm here also to challenge you, to own your piece of the, this puzzle because we're a community. So I think that's how I begin to think about it, Thomas, uh, that, um, that uh, um, one has to renegotiate the social contract so that there's a sense of collective responsibility for the risk. And then one can has more latitude for taking risks and then taking corrective action when you've made the wrong risk calculation. You. Yes, you're welcome. So now let's go to a question from the Q&A from Paula Chitwick. Um, she asked, how do you explain the adaptive versus technical approach to colleagues who are distracted by the fast, easy technical solution? What is the best way to build capacity on this? You know, tragically, people are going to learn through losses. Unfortunately, tragically, people who are, are making too risk, who are too risk tolerant, but actually they're not even calculating risks, they're just in denial. You know, they're, they're not really looking at the risks they're not looking at the data. They're not making a risk assessment. They're, they're avoiding a risk assessment. 
those people, unfortunately, and, you know, and there's um, many millions of people all around the world engaging in that denial. Um, they're going to end up learning the hard way. And it's tragic. I mean, and we see it over and over again. Many times the, uh, the teaching moment is generated by the tragedy. People uh, are going to have to learn through the tragedy. Now, I think what one wants to do with colleagues is try to say, is to plead with them, is to talk with them, is to, is to say, please don't do this. You know, I don't want to see you get ill. I don't want to see you infect your uncle or your grandfather. You know, please, please think twice about what you're doing. You know, let's find another way to keep the business open. Let's find another way to get you to pay rent. You know, let's find other ways we can buffer the, uh, the economic risk um, rather than uh, risking your family. You know, I, I think one has to exhaust every way one has to talk with people, to engage people, to talk with friends of friends, to try to talk with other people who they trust you know, to, to work the ecosystem of, our, of, of people that we know in order to help them um, face into the risk and, and actually calculate the risk uh, in, in a more thoughtful way. Um, but I also think, tragically, we need to stay in the game with compassion for the people who are going to only learn the hard way and not abandon them. When they begin to suffer the hard way, not to say I told you so, and not, but instead to say, okay, you know, I, um, you know, let me help you. Let me help you now sustain yourself. You know, let me help you mourn the loved ones that you've lost. You know, let me help you now work the um, economic consequences of once again having to having to stay home. You know, so I think it's going to require an enormous amount of compassion for staying in the game with people who are going to learn the hard way all around the world. Now let's go to Sarah Emerson. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor, this is, um, yeah, just, just amazing. So I really appreciate it. Um, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm a HKS uh, alum. I don't want to say the university I'm currently with in the UK, but let's just say it would be one that would consider itself one of the best in the world and certainly the best in the UK. And I'm a, an executive student in one of the programs for executive students, though it's a 21 month program. And it has been only a student response so far, as far as coming together and creating community, creating dialogue. And um, we have a WhatsApp group and, uh, you know, we have a number of uh, black, black participants, some from Africa and some uh, in Europe and the US. And uh, also, um, very explicit, uh, you know, I think voicing from white members of, of this particular cohort that they don't feel comfortable engaging in dialogue. So I'd reached out to the administration and said, you know, we'd like to have, you know, facilitated dialogue. At any rate, it's this idea, as you were saying, which is more about, well, let's wait for the authority to convene, we'll wait for the dean, we'll wait, you know, and, and I'm saying, hey, you know, there's, there's actually a really important, um, you know, moment here, and a lot of us want to um, help be a part of the systemic change. So I'm curious, without without coming across, and I didn't actually say hey or, or actually state those things, I'm asking your advice in the fact that not only does this institution consider itself one of the, you know, most important, you know, educational institutions in the world, but as you said, there's there's almost that, that you know, sort of mutual and symbiotic relationship of learning and growth that goes both ways. Um, how do I help to, you know, not necessarily demand, but um, get the the university support to understand that this isn't solved by a few town halls. You know, this is something that there needs to be consistent, uh, as you said, sort of getting through that that you know troubled pain. Um, I don't know if you do caving or spelunking, right? But it's incredibly uncomfortable at certain points. But you yes. continue on because you know that despite the discomfort, at the end there will be something that was worthwhile in doing that. And um, I just love your advice and how you help to. Um, and how you help to communicate that to these institutions that really should be at the forefront if we stand for what we say we stand for. And again, this is what you talked about sort of with the, um, you know, this inconsistency or, uh, or conflict within what our principles are. Uh, anyway, sorry for the long-winded question, but yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate the work. Yeah, you're talking about the endogenous challenge of, of inequity, social inequity or race relations or ethnic, ethnic prejudice. That's right. Uh, it's been with us for a very, very long time and has resurfaced again. You're not talking about the university's response to the 
Co coronavirus that's, crisis. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, I didn't distinguish. Yeah. I, 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 you know, first of all, I think we have to be in it for lifetimes. I mean, these cultures evolved over lifetimes, and the the particular lines of code, the module within these very rich, rich software packages called what it means to be British or what it means to be American or what it means to be French or what it means to be any ethnicity, any, any uh, political ethnicity or culture is um, it, it's a lot, you know, it's millions of lines of code. It's very complex and very rich and there's a lot worth conserving, but some, some, some lines of code need to be rewritten and uh, it is going to take a long time to rewrite those lines of code. So it seems to me that, one has to use this as a teaching moment and uh, find allies within uh, faculty and within administration to uh, take advantage of this teaching moment that this issue has surfaced once again and to use it to, uh, to generate social learning. Learning in the sense of, um, uh, of um, rectifying uh, some of the internal contradictions in our societies. Um, and of course, it's hard. People are attracted to our elite institutions like Harvard or, or you know, Oxbridge, uh, your universities, and um, because they're elite universities, you know, but can they be elite based on merit? Um, you know, somebody uh, who, uh, talking about affirmative action in the United States, said, but how about affirmative action for a legacy uh, and for, you know, the, the, the children of, of our alumni? Uh, why aren't you calling that affirmative action? So, you know, you, you have to stay in it. It's not, and you have to expect it to go surface and to go beneath the surface, above and beneath the surface. Um, and, and, and to stay in the game over time, looking for uh, opportunities to uh, engage people in this renegotiating of loyalties. Um, this might be such a time in, in American time um, I don't know if it's time in, 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 in British society, you know, uh, um, you, you just elected a very strong anti-immigrant anti -immigrant, uh, prime minister, um, the Brits did. So, so uh, the, you know, there's a, a strong effort to reclaim our dominant cultural identities, political identities, that is uh, enormously problematic around the world. You know, I, I, um, so don't lose heart, just run it, be, be experimental and run every experiment you can find in terms of alliance building, attention getting and uh, um, in order to draw people into the question. Thank you very much. Now we have a question from the Q&A uh, from Raj Chwala. What practices are needed for leaders to experience the disappointment their citizens are going to project on them? What are some stabilizing practices? Yes. Uh, the first is it's critically important to be present to people and to be an ongoing presence. In a time of distress, uh, people need to see. They're comforted simply by the physical availability of people in authority. They want to see their elders. So it's important to remain a, an ongoing presence to people. Second, it's going to be important to keep speaking uh, with compassion and heart to people's experience. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're in authority in a large community or in a country, you have to get to know all of the variations of suffering that people are going through and the variations of fear that people have, and the variations of anxiety that people are experiencing, and you have to be able to speak to them. So that means you have to you have to bring them into your office, you know, even if even if it's by Zoom or by by you know a conference call. You have to bring people's reality into your own awareness so that you can then speak in a way that people feel like, wow, he's he or she is not only present, but they really get where I'm at. I mean, they really see me. They see how afraid I am, they see how worried I am, or they see how much pain I am that I just had to say good that I that, that I just lost my favorite aunt, you know, and I couldn't even be with her when she died, you know, he, he sees, she sees. So the first is presence. The second is you've really got to know. Uh, it requires a lot of your empathic ability to project yourself into the, into the life experience of the, of the um, distrib distributed across your community so that you can really then third speak to the experience of your people with heart and compassion. 
And the fourth, then, you've got to uh, demonstrate to people that you're driving the organizational response because action itself generates confidence. And you've got to make sure that you're doing as competently as you can, as aggressively as you can, taking action. But then fifth, you've got to um, bring people into the reality of the uncertainty, that even the actions you're taking, as decisive as they are, are tentative, are experimental, are trial and error, you know, and that we're going to adjust our actions every day, and we're going to include you in the process. And, and, and so the crisis becomes an enormous opportunity for people in authority to renegotiate the social contract, <clears throat> and by presence, by um, um, empathic understanding, by speaking heartfully, by uh, decisive action um, that d demonstrates your technical competence, and by honest conversation where you're bringing people into the reality of the uncertainty. Um, uh, you hold people into um, a sustained period of disequilibrium that you cannot resolve because the situation doesn't allow you to resolve it. The virus is not going to allow you to resolve this crisis um, uh, through denial. I hope that just begins to outline a, uh, a mode of operating. Now I think we'll have to go to our last live question uh, with Donald Rukare. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. This is Donald from Uganda, Kampala. Good afternoon to all of you. Hello, and I'd like to thank the professor for the very good uh, presentation. My, I was intrigued by your graph where you had the productive range of stress. And my question to you is how do we determine the sweet spot of the, the optimum level of productive stress without tipping the balance? Because I believe individuals and communities have different thresholds of stress. So I've been kind of intrigued to know what kind of tools you have to determine the optimum level of, pro of productive stress. That is a great question, Donald. It's also an intellectual frontier in, uh, in, in leadership, in, the, in practical leadership studies, practical leadership analysis. There are some indicators when you're uh, reaching the limit of tolerance, the upper limit of tolerance, um, or when you're behold, below the threshold of learning, that lower line, I call the threshold of learning and the upper line, I call the limit of tolerance. You know, it's like cooking in a pressure cooker. You want to keep it within the range uh, that that vessel can contain. Now, over time, you, a, a, a community beca be, can become better at adaptive work and it can begin to raise the, that, that range of tolerable stress uh, so that it can cook at higher pressures. In a sense, you can move from cooking in a domestic strength pressure cooker to cooking in a uh, industrial strength pressure cooker. But that building of adaptive capacity takes time. In the immediate term, I think you're right that at, at um, that any point on that graph is actually an average and one could view it as a bar. Some people at that moment in time are actually overwhelmed individuals and other people are still cool and calm. You know, so you're kind of taking an average of where the organization or family or community is. And one has to then spot the, um, the outliers for indications of when the, the pressure cooker is beginning to dance on the stove and at risk of blowing up. Um, there are indicators, and, and I've written about this in my second book, Leadership uh, uh, on the Line, and a little bit as well in my third book, The Art and Practice of Adaptive Leadership, that I've co-authored. Um, uh, so I, I don't have time to speak to it right now, but I do think that there's indicators. But <clears throat> here's the key thing. Um, it's not like an engineered system where you can look at the temperature gauge in your car and know when it's overheating. Sometimes you only know that you're beginning to uh, get to the limit of tolerance by, um, by when the pressure cooker actually begins to dance. And then you have to bring the pressures down. You have to lower the pressures. And there are ways to do that, also that I describe in my writing. Um, so uh, it's, it's a trial and error thing. You know, You're, you have to stay close in touch with your people to begin to gauge when are they beginning to be overwhelmed? When are they learning as fast as they can, but they can't take on, on any more right now? And I've got to cool things down and give them more time to internalize what they've learned, to internalize their new capacity before I move to the next 
the, the next set of challenges um, on the road forward. One of the reasons the, our executive programs have begun to mount um, the series is because we think maybe the biggest contribution we've made to all of you is that you've begun to know each other. And if, if, if you can begin to create communities of learning and practice where you can teach each other and give each other tips across countries, across, across areas, across sectors, um, in the practice of leadership as an ongoing, uh, as, a, as an ongoing practice throughout, throughout your career where you debrief each other, where you meet and talk. And so one, one form that executive programs and, 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 and the regular alumni offices done at the Kennedy School is we've created a, a network for uh, alumni of our programs called the Adaptive Leadership Network. It's adaptive-leadership.net. And, and in that network, we've got um, thousands of people uh, who we come together and we've been discussing the race crisis. We've been discussing the, the coronavirus crisis. What does leadership look like? There are, there are courses, there are various kinds of resources. It's a new effort, but, it's, um, but I, I, I would encourage all of you to check it out as a means of staying connected with one another and staying connected with a community of people with whom to continue learning how to practice leadership, leadership in very dangerous times.